So in this video, we're going to talk about the Poisson distribution, and we're going to start off by just, well, discussing what is the Poisson distribution. We'll then do a derivation, and then we'll also do two basic examples at the end. So I certainly think um, understanding the derivation is great because it really bounces off of Bernoulli trials. So that's really where this is coming from, and understanding that is useful because there'll certainly be some overlap between the, these two distributions in statistics and probability. And for those of you going on, it's worth knowing that. Um, okay, so let's talk about what is this, this uh, Poisson distribution. So the idea is that some experiments result in counting the number of times particular events occur in given times or on physical objects. So let's, let's look at a couple examples of that. So, for example, we could count the number of phone calls arriving to a switchboard between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. So maybe you're the manager at AT&T or somewhere, right? You're probably interested in that, knowing how many calls come in, you know, over a certain hour span. So likewise, maybe you're, you know, you're in uh, manufacturing and you're going to count the number of defects in 100 cars, the next 100 cars that come off the assembly line. You want to count those number of defects. Or maybe you're counting the number of customers that arrive at a ticket window between 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. So each of these, each of these counts can be viewed as a random variable associated with an approximate Poisson process if we satisfy the following conditions. So don't worry about this approximate part. If we put that in there, it's going to make the math a little bit easier for now um, in terms of the derivation. If we leave it out, the math gets a little more complicated, but again, it all comes out in the end. So, okay, one thing I want to point out too that is useful, notice in a sense we're just counting, right? All we're counting is, for example, the number of people that come to a window. And just from that information, just from that information on counting, we already get a lot of useful information, it turns out. Okay, so let's get into the nitty gritty here. So the definition. So we're going to let the number of changes that occur in a uh, given continuous interval be counted. And we have an approximate Poisson process with parameter lambda greater than zero if we satisfy the following three conditions. So the number of changes occurring in non-overlapping intervals is independent. So for example, if I looked at my time interval, like I was looking at the number of people coming between 1 p.m. and 3 p.m., it says if I count the number of people, for example, that come from 1 to 2 p.m. and the number of people that come from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m., those are going to be completely independent. The number of people that show up from 1 to 2 p.m. will have absolutely no bearing on the number of people that show up from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m., um, vice versa. And that's true for all non-overlapping intervals. So the next condition says the probability of exactly one change in a sufficiently short interval of length h is we take that parameter lambda and multiply it by h. And then it says the probability of two or more changes in a sufficiently short interval is essentially zero. So we're going to chop up our interval so that you can have at most one change per interval. That's going to be part of the magic in the derivation. Okay, so here we go on the derivation. So let's assume that an experiment satisfies those three conditions. And what we're going to do is we're going to let x, that's going to denote the number of changes in an interval of length 1. So I've got my interval of length 1. I'm going to chop that up into n pieces, each of length 1 over n. And we want to approximate the probability that capital X equals little x. We want to approximate the probability of x changes during over over that interval okay so here's another little bit of the magic so we're going to approximate the probability of getting x changes by finding the probability we're going to find the probability that exactly one change occurs in exactly x of these n sub intervals so we're going to find the probability that again we get x changes now, let's use our conditions before, those three conditions. So the probability of one change in any one of those subintervals of length 1 over n is lambda times 1 over n. That was just our, um, our condition part b. And then the probability of two or more changes is 0 by our, that, that third condition, condition c. Okay. 
So it says for each subinterval, exactly one change occurs with probability of approximately lambda multiplied by 1 over n. So here's our key observation. This is where the Bernoulli um, trials come into it. So we're just going to consider the occurrence or non occurrence of a change in each subinterval, again, as a Bernoulli trial. And we're going to have a sequence of n Bernoulli trials with a probability p, and you can think about that probability p of being success, of getting a change, that probability of success is going to be equal to lambda multiplied by 1 over n. Well, that says the probability of getting x successes. We're just going to use that n choose n, or excuse me, n choose x, and then we multiply it by lambda over n to the x. Notice this is just going to be our p to the x, and this is going to be our q raised to the n minus, whoops, I wrote 1, n minus x over here. So we're just using, again, Bernoulli trials. Well, what we need to do, though, is we need to let n go to infinity. We're going to chop that interval up more and more and more. So now all we're doing is we're just taking that previous formula, we're tacking on the limit to that, and now we have to compute it. So that's really the idea is, well, what do we get here? Well, okay, so again, I've got it written down. I'll talk about it quickly. So notice if we simplify this n factorial over x, excuse me, n minus x factorial, that's going to leave me with the numerator n multiplied by n minus 1 dot 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 up to n minus x plus 1. Now notice my x factorial that was over there that was in the first factor, that's now moved over. My lambda to the x, that's still right there. And then my n to the x, that went underneath my, my first factor. And then everything else was almost left alone, except for this 1 minus lambda over n. I just broke that up using properties of exponents. OK, so let's keep computing. So at this point, I've got a bunch of limits uh, that depend on n. So I've got a bunch of limits that depend on n that I'm going to have to compute. And the limits that I'm going to have to compute as n goes to infinity, I'm going to have to look at the limit as n goes to infinity of this first factor, of this third factor, and also of that last factor. Notice the lambda to the x over x factorial. There's no n in there, so that's just going to be part of the formula. Well, I can use some algebra on this first factor. I can use some algebra on that first factor and rewrite it as 1 multiplied by the quantity 1 minus 1 over n dot 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 1 minus x minus 1 over n. And all we're doing is we're taking n over n. That would give me 1. I would take n minus 1 over n. That would give me my 1 minus 1 over n, etc., 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 just to rewrite that is all I'm doing. That's the algebra. Well, let's compute some limits. So this first limit that we would have to compute, well, you may recall this limit from calculus, and I'm just going to use that result. So it says the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 minus lambda divided by n raised to the n. That's going to be equal to my e to the negative lambda. So there's where that e to the negative lambda is coming from. Now notice for my next limit, as n goes to infinity, well, that denominator is going to get really, really big. So that whole uh, value, lambda over n, that's going to get closer and closer to 0. So we're just going to left, be left with 1 to some power. Well, that limit's just going to equal 1. And do we need too much else here? I think we're getting pretty close, actually. So if we compute this limit, we said this first part, that's going to give us... Um, we just computed, well, we didn't compute that part. Let's do that real quick. I knew we were missing something. So if we do compute that limit, same thing. Notice 1 over n, that's going to go to 0. x minus 1 over n, that's going to go to 0. You're just going to have a bunch of 1s being multiplied to be together. So that limit's just going to equal 1. I still have my lambda to the x over x factorial. That's still there. Now the 1 minus lambda over n raised to the n, we said that was our e to the negative lambda. And again, notice this last limit, as n goes to infinity, we just said that this term will be 0, and you're just going to be left with 1 as that limit. So we're left with, well, e to the negative lambda multiplied by lambda raised to the x over x factorial, and that is now um, what we had at the very, very, very... The very beginning.
Okay, so there's a justification. I think I put my e to the negative lambda first, but that's okay. Okay, so there's our nice, uh, our nice formula. And let me rewrite this actually one more time, because you typically do see that lambda to the x first when I have it, when I've seen it. So let me rewrite it one more time. So I'm going to write this as lambda to the x, e to the negative lambda, multiplied by x factorial. So that's the derivation. Okay, so now let's do um, a couple quick examples using the Poisson distribution. So suppose flaws on a used computer tape occur on the average of one flaw per 1,200 feet. We want to know what's the distribution of x, the number of flaws in a 4,800-foot roll. Well, okay, notice in this case the expected value of x, and again, x is going to be the number of flaws in this case. The expected... Um, the expected number of flaws would simply be equal to 4, right? Because we get 1 per 1,200 feet. Well, we've got 4,800 feet of, of computer tape. I would expect to get 4 flaws. And therefore, my distribution is going to look like f of x equals, well, now lambda is equal to 4. So I've got 4 to the x, e raised to the power of lambda, which is negative 4, Again, over x factorial, where x equals 0, 1, 2, etc. So what's the probability of zero flaws? Well, the probability of zero flaws, that's going to be 4 raised to the 0 multiplied by e raised to the negative fourth power over 0 factorial. And I got this to be 0 0.018. Right? And if you, if you expect 4, right, the probability of getting 0, it probably shouldn't be too small or it shouldn't be too big, rather. It should be pretty small, is what I mean. Now, the, sec the, the last part, what's the probability of four or fewer flaws? Well, that's going to be the probability of getting zero flaws plus the probability of getting exactly one flaw up to the probability of getting exactly four flaws. And you can compute this the exact same way. You would plug, you would plug zero into the formula. That's how we got the first value. You would plug 1 in for x, that's how you would get the next value. You would plug 2 in for x, etc., etc. That's how you would compute them. Again, all of these are, you can find these in tables and books. So I got this to be 0 0.629. So the probability of four or fewer flaws is 0.629, which is kind of interesting, right? Because a lot of people may think, well, if you expect um, to get four, maybe four or fewer should be 50%, but no, it's definitely not. So let's look at our sep second example here. Uh, calls enter a switchboard on average of two calls every three minutes. We want to know what's the probability of five or more calls in a nine-minute period. So I'm going to let, I'm going to say X is the number of calls in that nine minute period. Now, the first thing I always have to come up with is this expected value of x. What would be the expected number of calls in that nine minute period? Well, we said we get uh, two calls every three minutes. So I guess we would get six calls in nine minutes is what I would expect. So we're trying to compute the probability of getting five or more calls. That's what we're trying to compute. Now, obviously, we couldn't compute this the way we did a second ago because you would have to compute the probability of x equals five plus the probability x equals six plus, right? And this goes on infinitely. So we can't compute it that way. But what I'll do, again, is just use this notion of complements. This is going to be one minus the probability that you get, well, four flaws or, excuse me, we're not, we're not talking about flaws anymore, uh, four calls or less. And I got this to be 1 minus 0 0.285 or 0 0.715 would be um, the solution. That's going to be the probability of five or more calls in a nine-minute period. So if you expect six on average, it says there's almost a 72% probability that you're going to get five or more calls. Okay, all right, so just some basic examples. Um, and yeah, I hope these help. If you like these, please let me know. Um, as always, thank you to my supporters on Patreon. 
Um, if you like these videos and want to see more, please head over there. You can go to Patreon. You can find me there, Patrick JMT. And you can help a guy out for about three cents a day if you want to help support the videos. So, all right, my friends. Again, I hope these help you. And, yeah, good luck.